Well, good hot evening to you, church. So, yeah, it's good to have you all. So, uh, lots of folks out today for multiple reasons, but we give thanks for those who are here. And um, we pray for those watching online, and uh, we just thank you for the time to, to gather together tonight. So, uh, we are heading towards the latter part of the study on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath, that we've been sort of doing an excursus on out of uh, Genesis chapter 2 and 2. And uh, so, Lord willing, we'll navigate this. So if you don't have your next worksheet, make sure you have that because we will get into that tonight. Um, So, uh, yeah, well, let's pray. Father, we love you. Thanks for your goodness to us. Thank you for the beauty of the day. Thanks for the work done and accomplished. And we ask, Father, for just that extra amount of energy mentally to stay at the course and uh, we pray for your Holy Spirit to just meet us where we are tonight. We pray, Father, for those who are uh, just needing a touch of, of your hand, of healing, of grace and mercy. Uh, we think of Brother Steve. We think of Brother Grover. We think of uh, Brother Harry, um, others, uh, Brother Malcolm. Uh, we just pray, Father, for them tonight that there would just be a touch of healing and well-being uh, for them tonight, Lord. And we just thank you for allowing us to enter into your presence with that. And for others that I may not know of or have forgotten today, Lord, we just pray that you'll bless them too. Uh, Be with all those who are watching tonight, uh, that they would study well with us. And we pray and ask now that your Holy Spirit uh, would just come be our teacher, that we might be good students. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, please. Amen. Uh, I'm going to back you up to the question that we entered into. Uh, we looked at Deuteronomy 5.12 and Mark 2, uh, but we landed on the, the answer. Uh, but let's back up and grab the question and then move to the, to the answer itself. So according to Deuteronomy 5.12 to 5, 15, so according to the law and according to the Gospels, what was the Sabbath made for? Okay. So as we move through, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or uh, any of your animals, and nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that you, your male and female servants, may rest as you do. Uh, remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, because of that, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath. So if you're a good Bible student, you get, you're getting answers in that, aren't you? Yeah. Therefore, keep the Sabbath. Why? Because of everything I just told you. That's why we need to do it. Mark, uh, then Jesus said to them, he, uh, the Sabbath Shabbat was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Shabbat or the Sabbath. So when we look at the answer to that, the first is this. In Deuteronomy The reason we keep the Sabbath or the rest is remember that you were what? Remember that your employer didn't really give a rip about you and you worked how many days a week? You worked seven. There was no day off. That's what slaves do. They're they're not humans. They're beasts. So remember that you were that, that you didn't have any rest. All right? Second, Deuteronomy, remember that God delivered you from that church. I put this in particular, non-rest context. He moved you out of that. Does that make sense, church? The Sabbath day was then and is for even us today then. It's a gift of rest in an otherwise constant work week. So, I'm going to ask a practical question on this. So what do you say then to a workaholic that works seven days a week? Uh, God gave you a gift and you're not receiving it. Go back through the points. You'll get it. What, is it. what do you say to somebody who is a workaholic seven days a week, nonstop, 
don't be a slave. Put it in the positive. It's not positive, but don't negate it, Terry. You are a word, keyword, slave. You are a slave. You are a slave to your job. You're a slave to money. You're a slave. You're, sl- you're a slave. You're, you're in slavery. Well, I own the company. To, I don't care. <laughs> you're a slave. You're, you're, you're an owner, but you're not acting like it. You're, you're acting like you are a servant to whatever you're doing. Because, yeah, Bill, thoughts? Yes, Bill said he grew up with the blue laws, and many, many of us are old enough to do that. I'm 28. I barely remember it, but um, uh, I remember that. Wednesdays was for what? Church. You didn't have any activities on Wednesdays. Uh, and if you were pagan, well, you didn't do anything. <laughs> uh, or you worked at the restaurants so that the pagan or the spiritual people could go out to eat. Um, Sundays, everything was closed. You, you didn't do anything. Nothing was opened. And then when did that shift happen? I don't know when the blue laws left. 60s? 70s? I don't know when it was. I was young. Um, so restaurants started going. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't think it was anything in particular. I just think things started staying open. And before you know it, everybody stayed open. And before you know it, knew it schools were having every athletic event on not only Wednesdays but also Sundays so that nobody could go to church does that sound demonic to you by the way keeping God's people out of church Um, I don't know yeah Bill asked uh, so is it wrong to go to a restaurant on Sunday and eat Uh, you know what Uh, if you're a pagan and you're working um, you know oh by the way, Jesus gives the answer. I was just hoping somebody would pick it up. You didn't, so I'm very sad. Um, Jesus said, oh, you know Dan? Dan has to work on Sundays because he's what? He's a pastor. That's his work day. Yeah, sorry. So, so guess when his Sabbath is? It's an, it's an hour on Tuesday, two on Thursday, between 12 and 5 in the morning on Friday. Uh, I get it in there somehow. <laughs> so, yeah. It's whenever you can take a day off. Police officers, hospital workers, care facilities. So... So do you know, if you remember back to Genesis 2, that's what Jesus is saying. Look, you've turned this into a legal issue. It's not. It's principle. Which means, in your seven days of work, possible, wherever you can find it, be intentional and do what? Take a day off. Do something different. Don't do that. The Sabbath was made for you as a gift. Rest. Yes, please, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Absolutely. So Mary was just confessing her sin that she used to put a roast in on Sunday morning and uh, somebody called her out on that and she wanted to know what the difference was between eating a cheaper roast that probably tasted better at home than eating at a restaurant and making other people to sin. So (laughs) So Mary Mary said the confessional is open and she'd be glad to keep going but for the sake of time we're not going to do that. So uh, but do you see how legalistic we get that some folks get with that? And, and that's, wasn't that Jesus' argument? What are you doing? You're making the Sabbath a law. And Genesis 3, do you remember the point I banged into you? Genesis chapter 2 and 2, 
that was not a law. And it actually, if you press it, it wasn't even principled. Does that make sense? The principle, uh, uh, the, the set aside, the juxtaposition is chapter two and three. Chapter two, God looked at everything and it was very good. And on the seventh day, he rested from his work. He ceased from his labors. Chapter three, God created a man and a woman. Uh, oh, actually, it's not three. It's at the end of the two. It's at it's chapter end, end of chapter two. Same thing. He created a man. He created a woman. And because of that, he says, there's the principle. She is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Principle. And a, a man shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one. There's a principle, isn't there? It's called the oneness principle, by the way. That's a principle. We get the principle in the text. We don't get the principle in Genesis 2 and 2. There's nothing in there that gives us that. It's just descriptive. It said God stopped, he rested, and he said everything was good. Now he's going to use that as a pattern down the road. And we saw that with the Jewish people, remember that? God now uses the Sabbath, Sabbath per Exodus 20, and now the Sabbath to the Jews is a what? It's a law. Okay, it's one of the Ten Commandments. Do not do this. So much so that when they got into the, out of the Exodus into the, prom, into the wilderness, they caught a guy picking up sticks to go cook, to cook supper and somebody caught him on the Sabbath and they did what with the guy? They killed him. Law. No mercy. Law. Because why? It was a sign unto the Jews of a covenant promise that was received, Abrahamic. So it doesn't extend to us, all right? Question, read Colossians 2 and 16 to 17. What was the spiritual intentions of the Shabbat? And also we'll cross-reference that with Hebrews 4, 4 and 11. Uh, Colossians, therefore, do not let anyone judge you. Did you hear that? Don't let anybody judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, first of the month, or a Sabbath day. These are a church. They are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality of that idea, that principle, however, is found where? In Christ. There's where our ultimate rest comes from. Hebrew, oh, Psalm 95 and 7 to 8. Uh, for somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. Oh, was that? Oh, that's the quotation of Psalm 95. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again in this passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, this is Hebrews for. And since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This is this he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. For if Joshua had given them rest when they went into the promised land, God would not have spoken later about another day of what? Rest. So there still remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter into that rest so that no one will perish by following the example of disobedience. That has to do with belief, does it not? So this is a salvific issue. It's a salvation issue. So every other religion, in order for you to get to heaven, you have to do what? Works. You have to work. You have to do something in order to appease God. And the Bible clearly says as they move through in regards to the Shabbat, the Sabbath rest, when Christ offered up himself as our one and only sacrifice once for all, and he rested when he said, it is finished, his job is done. Now, if I believe in him, if I obey him, Hebrews 2, salvation comes to me. 
So I no longer have to work for my salvation, which never worked anyway. I simply do what? Rest in the finished work of Christ. That's all I do. I rest in him. And that's why the world says, uh, come on, that's way too easy. You know, it's got to be, there's got to be more to that. You got to do something. Every other religion does something. So this can't be right. And it's like, that's the difference between Christianity and other world religions. Every other world religion demands something of you. Christianity doesn't accept your reception of the gift that God has given to you. Does that make sense? Everybody following? So the Sabbath in Genesis 2 and 2, God, inst- this is the beauty of this. We didn't need to know that, but God wanted us to know it because all the way in the very beginning of things, he planted something that would be effectual five, you know, 3,000 years later. Does that make sense? With Christ. Christ rested from his work as God rested it from his. And now we have this rest that God gives to us as a gift. Physical rest, spiritual rest. Uh, yeah. Terry. Of course. Yeah, there's, it's, there's an action implied in that. And when you look at the example of the Jewish people, the Shabbat, the rest, it was for worship, by the way, and it was for fellowship. It was enjoying God's creation. All that stuff was a part of that. So I've got a question out there. So a Sabbath day of rest was a... Church, a visible representation of a future day of spiritual rest where humankind stopped working either for their salvation because of Christ or for their reward because Christ has fully redeemed them from this world. So one has to do with salvation, the other has to do with death. Does that make sense? I stopped. I, when I die, I stop working and serving the Lord and he gives me the ultimate rest where I don't have to, to do that anymore. Okay. Does this mean that we don't have to keep the Sabbath? How many say no? How many say yes? One and a half. And three quarters. Absolutely. Jesus got in trouble because he always did what on the Sabbath? (laughs) He always worked on the Sabbath. However, if you read the rest of the Gospels, Jesus also then did what? He took a day off. So he said, I'm going to go up to the mountains. I'm just going to pray. It's a trick question, by the way, as always. A, legally? Church, answer? No. No, I don't have to keep the Sabbath because I am not under what? I'm not under the Mosaic Law. I'm not a Jew. So it's not assigned to me. Okay. Spiritually, no, because our full rest is yet to come, so we continue to work to build the kingdom just as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are still at work. So I'm still working, yes? Yeah, of course, yeah. Practically, church, yes. Taking a day out of our work week is to rest is a beneficial practice that models to our world the actions of our creator God who rested. A week or two, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> or if you're like Terry, she's retired. She doesn't do anything all day long, so yeah. <laughs> I, 
I'm accruing my Sabbath days. That's what I'm doing. I'm accruing them. So legally, no, we're not under the law, all right? Do we have to keep the Sabbath spiritually? No, because we're not there yet, all right? If it has to do with my salvation, yes, okay? I'm resting in Christ. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, the work that God has continued asking me to do. So I still need to do that. But practically, in the midst of that work, yes, I do need to take a day off. It, it images God. That's the Imago Dei part of us. We rest. You can keep adding to your list, by the way, of Imago Dei, because some of the stuff I don't even put on there. Most people wouldn't say that, by the way. If you look at the Imago Dei listing, I don't know if I've ever seen a list where uh, resting was part of the image of God. But it is, isn't it? Yeah, I image God by resting, by enjoying the creation, doing those types of things. Are we to worship on Sunday as opposed to the Jewish Sabbath Friday sundown to Saturday sundown? Uh, that would have to do, Kathy s said, uh, John 4 with the woman in the well, uh, different context. He called her out on her sin. So she was saying, where do I sacrifice, Mount Gerizim or Mount Jerusalem? And Jesus said, there's going to come a time where it doesn't matter where you go. You can make things right with God because the relationship's going to be different. That's what that would mean. So... Yes, in general, we can worship wherever we're at. In fact, we're called to be 24-7 worshipers. That's how we're supposed to worship God. So, thoughts, other thoughts? Uh, the Bible talks about the disciples met on the first day of the week. Uh, so, that's going to be important in our discussion as well. Okay. Um, as followers of Jesus, we can worship him, Kathy. Any day of the week we want. Historically, the primitive church, which was mainly of Jews, continued to do what? If you look at the book of Acts, chapter 1, Jesus is ascending. He's giving them the command, hang out in the upper room until the Holy Spirit comes. Holy Spirit comes in three. Got it? Two. He gets into three. They get in trouble on four because Peter and John were going up to what? To worship. They were going up to the temple. They were doing what Jews do. They were going up to the temple to worship, to pray three times a day. Morning prayers, noon prayers, and e uh, evening, afternoon prayers. That was their tradition. Why? Because just because they accepted Christ, it didn't change the fact that they were still Jews. So they were still meeting in the synagogues, but also they met, Acts 2, 42, every day in the houses. Learning the apostles' doctrine, communion, fellowship, all those types of things. Every day to learn, to worship, to celebrate, and encourage each other. But this is the historical prog progression. As time went on, and by the way, very quickly, the Christian church began to meet formally on, Deb said, the first day of the week, Sunday, as a reminder of the resurrection and also, uh, there's another reason here I didn't put, and also because it now included what? Gentiles. You've got a mixed church. The third reason that I don't have up there would also be what? How long do you think you're going to last in a very traditional Orthodox Jewish synagogue when they know you're a follower of Christ? Not going to last long at all before they kick you out, which is what happened. So the third point in that is persecution of the Jewish Orthodox Jewish people who rejected Christ as the Mashiach. So lots of other reasons, but those are the ones. Okay. How does Acts fifteen help us to understand this, especially verses ten to eleven and nineteen to twenty one? Now, then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles? Remember, Acts fifteen is the first church council. There were some believers who came down from Antioch in the north and said, hey, we're believers in Jesus, but you've got to start commanding the Gentiles to do what? Get circumcised. 
They need to follow the law of Moses. It went before that, by the way, to Abraham. Jesus picked up on that in John 8. So then why do you try, this is the answer, then why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear, obeying the law? Ume, strongest way you can say it. No, we believe it's through, church, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved just as they are. It is my judgment, James comes into the conversation, Jesus' half-brother, the leader of the Jerusalem church, it's my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write them and tell them to do these things, to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from meat of strangled animals, and from blood. And all of those, except for the sexual immorality part, but I think that has to do with temple prostitute worship. I think it fits. I don't think it's, if, it's, if it isn't, it's an oddity. That's why I think it has to do with worship. All four of those have to do with offending who? Well, not only God, but more importantly, Jewish people. Because isn't that part of the law? Yeah, don't, don't abstain from food polluted to idols. We don't do that. Jews don't do that. Abstain from sexual immorality. Don't go into the temple and engage with the temple prostitutes. That's a bad thing. Don't do that. It offends everybody, even God. Don't eat meat strangled uh, because it's connected with point four. Some only see three here. Four is the additive because of the conjunction. If you strangle an animal, it's not the normal way to butcher something. You have to do what? Cut the throat. Get the blood out because you cannot eat the blood of the animal because Leviticus says the life of the animal is found in the blood. The blood is used for sacrifice, not for consumption. And so that picks that up. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city. That's how I know this has to do with Jewish people. 21 tells you, right? If you don't get that, then 21 doesn't make sense, does it? Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and don't do this. Why? 21? Because in the synagogue where your Jewish people are, if they know you're doing those things, you've lost your witness and your testimony. You're not going to be able to speak of Christ. You're doing things that are offensive to them. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogue and on every Saturday. Bobby Walters, Robert, he does not eat pork. He's not Jewish. He's a Gentile. He won't eat pork when he comes to Logan's Port. It's a conviction. Why? He does not want to offend the people that he's trying to reach in Brooklyn. Yeah, but he's in Logan's Port. Nobody knows. He knows. God knows, and somebody on YouTube will know, <laughs> uh, you know, so, you know, I, I applaud him for his convictions. He's trying to reach the Jewish people, and so he's not going to do things that bring offense to them, and that's the point. What is my point in regards to the Shabbat in this argument? Anybody take a guess? What did James tell the Gentiles they didn't have to do? It's in absentia. If it was important, they would have put it in there. Here's what you need to do, Gentiles. You need to make sure that you don't eat food polluted by idols, abstain from sexual immorality, don't eat meat strangled uh, by animals and blood, and for all purposes, you've got to keep the Sabbath Friday to Saturday. What do we not see in this? We do not see Sabbath. We don't see the Sabbath command. This has to do with Gentiles being brought into the church. And if there was ever a place, it would have been here in the first church council that had to do with the law. Now, they're not dealing with Sabbath. They're dealing with circumcision. But it's the same thing, isn't it? Because cir circumcision per Abraham was connected to what? The covenant promise of God and the rest. So, does that all make sense, church, as we wrestle through that? Good answer. The issue at hand was whether Gentiles must be required to be circumcised to be part of the church. In other words, do they need to keep the physical symbol of the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic law? Answer is 
No. And if there was ever a time to put a Sabbath requirement in, it would have been now. But there is no Sabbath requirement to Gentiles in regards to that. There is no law. However, there still is what? Principle. Take a rest. All right? He's not saying Gentiles can work seven days a week. He said, no, 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 no. If you're in the image of God, if you're in part of the Imago Dei, you need to rest too because you image God when you do that. What does that have to do with the law? Answer, church. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the law. The law didn't come for 400 years after Abraham died. Okay, it came during Moses. It had nothing to do with Abraham. Yes, Chris? The day of rest became a law for the Jews. No. It, it's a principle of rest because of what Jesus is talking about. So it's, it's is it, is it, Healthy for us to take a rest? Of course it is. Yeah. It's part of the Imago Dei, Chris. That's what I'm talking about. So, yeah. Because if not, you wind up being slaves. Is that what we're, as, that's the point. That was Jesus' point. Jesus always got to the heart of the law, didn't he? You know, keep the Sabbath. So when I look at that from my perspective, as I look at the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments are not, um, prohibitions. They speak about the character of God. Does that make sense? Thou shalt not covet. Why? Because God will provide. God's a provider. It tells me something about God. Keep the Sabbath and make it holy. It's a holy day. What does that tell me about God? It's holy, but it also tells me that God ceased and rested and he wants me to do the same thing does that make sense so when you look at the prohibitives when you look at the negative commandments in the scriptures like that you've got to get out of the out of your mind it's the it's the 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 10 laws of exodus 20 and deuteronomy 5 it's laws this is what god's you got to do this or he's going to be really mad at you just read the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That's not what Jesus is doing. Jesus is unraveling all of those things, is he not? Of course he is. You've heard it said, thou shalt not commit murder. All right? Go back into Deuter to Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. What is it about God that I need to know from that passage, from that prohibition? Don't kill. Um, you need to know your Bible on this. Life. Don't kill each other because you are the image of God. You represent me on earth. Don't mar me. Don't abuse me. Don't kill me. Because <laughs> that's what you're doing. You're affronting me as a person. So look at the Ten Commandments and, and the Decalogue. Look at those things differently. They're not prohibitives. They're prohibitives, but they're prohibitives because they're supposed to be teaching us who this God is in relationship with each other. Everybody following me on that? Yeah. So when you get to the Shabbat, when you get to the Sabbath in the Ten Commandments, you see the law, but the law is not the law law. It's not the prohibition although that's true for the Jewish people, but for, for me, when I look at the Ten Commandments and I see the Sabbath, it's, I'm made in the image of God. I need to rest. That's what that is, all right? Good. Yeah, God is not gonna show up on, but he might look at that with the unbeliever in the great, great white throne judgment, and he says, you know, when you mowed your grass on Saturday or when you did all this other work and you never rested, it was a violation of my image. You, you dispensed with the gift that I gave you. So I mow my grass on my day off. Does anybody else do that? 
I do too. I mean, I very seldom have a day where I don't do anything because if I'm not mowing my grass, Deb will tell you I'm reading and all God's, Dan's wife said, <laughs> I'm reading, I'm reading something, I'm studying something, but I rest with that because I love reading and I love learning and so it's not a big deal for me. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Terry's talking about gardening. I mean, at some point the weeds got to get pulled, you know, they just do. They got to be tended to. And if it's what you love to do, then it's, I say this, pastoring for me is not work. Why? I love what I do. I really do which makes it hard for me to take a what? A Sabbath because of that. There's good pros and cons to that, all right? How do Romans 2, 28 and 29 and Colossians 2, 11 and 12 add to the discussion? Uh, this is Romans. A person is not a Jew who is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart. We talked about that on Monday night in the sacraments that we've been studying. By the spirit, not by the written code, such a person's praise is not from others, other people, but from God. So if you look at this passage and you put it in a Shabbat context, what can I say about this? Keeping the Sabbath is not making me a full-bore Christian because I keep the Sabbath. That's legalism. I'm really a follower of Jesus when I keep the Sabbath because of my, of my heart attitude toward God. That's where it starts, doesn't it? That's the point. That's what Jesus was talking about. So, you know, don't look at the outward expression. So there are a lot of people who don't do what their six-day-a-week job does, but the Sabbath, they'll do another part-time job doing something else and they'll, does that make sense? Well, I'm not working. I'm not, I'm not, at, the, I'm not at the plant, you know. I'm, I'm doing this. It's like, it's still work. You're not resting, all right? Heart issue. They might be doing something they love. All right, there we go. I don't have a problem with that. So we don't want to be legalists on this, yes? We want to be grace-oriented people. Uh, Colossians, in Jesus, uh, you're also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. All right? Once again, it's this, this heart issue that God is after when we're resting. If you... If you hear language like this, well, I have to, it's a real good indication of something, isn't it? I have to go to church Sunday. Deb says that to me every week. <laughs> you have to go. You're the pastor. If, I, if I'm a lay person and I say that every Sunday, no, I can't, I can't do that. I, ha I have to go to church. I'm not talking about an obedience issue. I'm talking about heart issue. And what do you hear with that? What do you hear in that statement? It's unpleasant. I don't want to go. I don't want to be there. Jer Jeremiah said this so wonderfully, didn't he? He said, why don't you guys just shut the gates of the temple? I am sick and tired of you guys coming in and saying, man, I can't wait for this Sabbath thing to be done so we can get back to business and selling and making money. Jeremiah said that. And, and God said, shut the doors. Sh just shut them. I don't want your sacrifices. I don't want any of your stuff. Because it's not coming from where, church? It's not coming from your heart. This is just ritual obligation for you. I have to go to church. Well, why do you have to go to church? It's expected. Well, why is it expected? I don't know. My mother made me when I was a kid. 
I don't know what the answer is, but it surely isn't what God's looking for, is it? I want to come to church because, hey, do you want to come with me? Because, man, I get so encouraged on Sunday with God's people. I get to worship and praise the Lord. I get to hear a message from God's word that stirs me and makes me a better person. Man, I can't wait to go to church on Sunday. Do you hear the difference in that? Wow, completely different. Circumcision like the Sabbath was not what? It was not mandated by the first church council. It was a symbol of something greater that would find its fulfillment in Jesus. So the Gentile people were still called to be circumcised. Except it wasn't down there. It was up here. It was circumcision of the heart. That's what Jesus was after. We good to go? Are we done with that one then? Any questions on the Sabbath? On the Shabbat? Good stuff? Learned a lot, I hope? Good deal. All right, Ms. Sarah, we're going to get out of that. And uh, before we get into the next uh, lesson, I, I've been ruminating over this, and I've actually been following uh, this guy from Jerusalem. He's a professor of history. He's a very wicked man. I'll just tell you that. He is right up front. Uh, he is sold out to evolution. Uh, there is no God he teaches at Hebrew, Hebrew University in Israel, all right? But I was thinking about the Imago Dei, and then I was thinking about the evolutionary mindset. We talked about this a little bit, and I, I broached the subject with Bill. I don't know if it was last Thursday or the two Thursdays before. But I said, I made this statement in that Wednesday night service. If you are an evolutionist, humanity is not the end. Homo sapiens is not the end because evolution by its very nature does keeps doing what? It keeps changing and evolving. And if you are a true evolutionist that believes in transitory uh, kind, not species, from going from this kind, a reptile, transitioning into a bird, if you hold to a transitory evolutionary model, then humanity, by the very argument of that, at some point has to do what? It has to, my language, transition from what we presently are to something else. So we're going to watch this, and I want you to listen. Uh, Miss Sarah, I don't know, can you, when we watch this, can you pause that at times, kind of like I do when I ask you to read on Monday night? I interrupt you like five times, all right? If, if you can have your finger on it, I want to just kind of pause something because there's so much in this that I want to just grab it as it comes at us, okay? So let's go, and uh, let's see if we can be scared out of our wits. This is uh, him. He's preaching at night. Uh, it's a, the quality is very bad, but... So is that a full screen, Sarah? Thank you so much. Oh, there we go. Okay, here we go. We live in a world of never-ending change. As we progress and introduce new technologies and innovations, the way we interact with society will change. Dr. Yuval Noah Harari, macro historian, professor, and best-selling author of Sapiens, as well as one of the world's most innovative and exciting thinkers, has a few hypotheses of his own on the future of humanity. He examines what might happen to the world when old myths are coupled with new godlike technologies, Can you such stop? as artificial intelligence. Stop, Sarah. What did you just hear? 
old myths coupled with godlike technology. Does that give you an indication of things? It's interesting. And this is interesting because he's an atheist. Yes, he does. This terminology that he's poking around in. All right, Miss Sarah. And genetic engineering. We are probably one of the last generations of Homo sapiens. Stop. Within a century or two. Stop. We are the last generation of Homo sapiens. So we are the last generation of human, 100% uh, human. That's what he's trying to get at. Okay, next, Ms. Sarah. Earth will be dominated by entities that are more different from us than we are different from Neanderthals or from chimpanzees. There's the transitory. Because in the coming generations, we will learn how to engineer bodies and brains and minds. Now, how exactly will the future masters of the planet look like? This will be decided by the people who own the data. Those who control the data control the future, not just of humanity, but the future of life itself. Because today, data is the most important asset in the world. In ancient times, land was the most important asset. And if too much land became concentrated in too few hands, humanity split into aristocrats and commoners. Then in the modern age, in the last two centuries, machinery replaced land as the most important asset. And if too many of the machines became concentrated in too few hands, humanity split into classes, into capitalists and proletariats. Now data is replacing machinery as the most important asset. And if too much of the data becomes concentrated in too few hands, humanity will split not into classes, it will split into different species. Pause. <laughs> now he's talking transitory because he's not using biblical language. He's not saying they turn into a different kind. But what he's saying is there, what's coming up next is the transitory step for that to happen. So whoever owns the data, the datum, plural, they're the ones that are going to, to manipulate and to design this. Those are the power brokers, all right? Pull the plug, absolutely. Next, please, Ms. Sarah. As technology advances faster than our understanding of it, you will also allow us to upgrade our brains and nervous systems. Connecting our brains directly to the internet also means that hackers will have direct access into our minds. They can steal information from us and modify our beliefs and opinions. We have reached the point when we can hack not just computers, we can hack human beings and other organisms. Pause. Bill says that this is one theory of the rapture. Uh, how how th this group explains why there's so many people gone. Because we are now of the lower system. And we were basically gotten rid of. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> next please. There is a lot of talk these days about hacking computers and email accounts and bank accounts and mobile phones, but actually we are gaining the ability to hack human beings. Now what do you need in order to hack a human being? You need two things. You need a lot of computing power and you need a lot of data, especially biometric data. 
not data about what I buy or where I go, but data about what is happening inside my body and inside my brain. Until today, nobody had the necessary computing power and the necessary data to hack humanity. But this is now changing because of two simultaneous revolutions. On the one hand, advances in computer science, and especially the rise of machine learning and AI, are giving us the necessary computing power. And at the same time, advances in biology, and especially in brain science, are giving us the necessary understanding, biological understanding. Harari suggests the possibility that humans are algorithms, and as such, Homo sapiens may not be dominant in a universe where robots and AI will most likely replace us in our jobs once they become intelligent enough. Although he is hopeful that AI might help us solve many problems, such as healthcare, climate change, poverty, overpopulation, and terrorism, we can no longer be certain about anything, including things that previously seemed fixed and eternal. You can really summarize 150 years of biological research since Charles Darwin in three words. Organisms are algorithms. This is the big insight of the modern life sciences, that organisms, whether viruses or bananas or humans, they are really just biochemical algorithms. And we are learning how to decipher these algorithms. Now, when the two revolutions merge, when the infotech revolution merges with the biotech revolution, what you get is the ability to hack human beings. And maybe the most important invention for the merger of infotech and biotech is the biometric sensor that translates biochemical processes in the body and the brain into electronic signals that a computer can store and analyze. And once you have enough such biometric information and enough computing power, you can create algorithms that know me better than I know myself. And humans really don't know themselves very well. This is why algorithms have a real chance of getting to know ourselves better. We don't really know ourselves. The algorithm tracks your eye movements, your blood pressure, your brain activity, and tells you who you are. Once we have algorithms that can understand me better than I understand myself, they could predict my desires, manipulate my emotions, and even take decisions on my behalf. And if we are not careful, the outcome might be the rise of digital dictatorships. In the 20th century, democracy generally outperformed dictatorship because democracy was better at processing data and making decisions. Democracy processes information in a distributed way. It distributes the information and the power to make decisions between many institutions and individuals. Dictatorship, on the other hand, concentrates all the information and power in one place. Now, given the technological conditions of the 20th century, distributed data processing worked better than centralized data processing, which is one of the main reasons why democracy outperformed dictatorship only under the unique technological conditions of the 20th century. In the 21st century, new technological revolutions, especially AI and machine learning, might swing the pendulum in the opposite direction. They might make centralized data processing far more efficient than distributed data processing. And if democracy cannot adapt to these new conditions, then humans will come to live under the rule of digital dictatorships. By hacking organisms, elites may gain the power to re-engineer the future of life itself.
Because once you can hack something, you can usually also engineer it. Professor Harari looks to the future and explores how global power might shift as the principal force of evolution, natural selection, is replaced by intelligent design. After four billion years of organic life, the era of inorganic life is now beginning. In the coming decades, AI and biotechnology will give us godlike abilities to re-engineer life and even to create completely new life forms. After four Did billion you hear that? years create new of life organic form. life shaped by natural selection, we are about to enter a new era of inorganic life shaped by intelligent design. Our intelligent design is going to be the new driving force of the evolution of life. There are many ways in which the future of humanity might play out in the coming decades. We already see the impact of infotech and biotech in the present day, but as we wait for them to grow and expand, it's only natural to wonder what will happen in the next few decades. We can expect to see some really interesting developments as all these fields of science and technology will continue to rapidly advance. One thing is for sure, humanity has some pretty big decisions to make. Thanks for watching. Did you like this video? There then you go, show Sarah. Your support. You can be done with it. So what do you think about stuff like that? There, that stuff's already out there. I mean, uh, yeah, Tim foil, <laughs> aluminum foil on your head. That's what we need to start doing. Then they'll really be able to identify us as Christians. So Doc, please. Yep. Blood disease, yeah. Bleeder disease. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's how they're going to sell things. Ms. Sarah, we'll probably stop tonight. We won't jump into four. Um, but, uh, but it's a beautiful garden, though, isn't it? Though? I've, good slide. Um, we're already so far into this stuff that we don't even realize it. I mean, we aren't, you know. Uh, if you have an Apple Watch, you have a program on it that can do what? It can do your heart rate, I mean, it, it monitor your sleep, I mean, brain weight. I mean, it can do everything. That's why I don't have an Apple Watch. I've still got one that winds up. So, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of biometric stuff that's already taken place uh, that has already moved us into this area. But I just find it interesting to listen to an evolutionist thinking about the next species you know, and if you're not on board with this, you are a subclass of individuals. It's just the way it is. So, yeah. Uh, that was back there. Yeah, absolutely. A picture of it. Uh, Peter. What was the name of that? Oh, sure. And I don't know if you listen to this, how many times he used intelligent design in that? Except his view of intelligent design is man, is man and coming up the man-machine combo package that's probably going to make its way our way if it's not already. Of course, yeah. Yeah, I mean, people live 20 years longer than they did 100 years ago, and it's not because we didn't die earlier, so they can keep us alive a lot longer. So, and I'm not sure if that's a good thing either, by the way, but it's just part of the world that we live in. So I, I think about that because we're heading into uh, the section on when God creates man and woman. And so it's interesting to see how God is thinking and uh, what, man is thinking and by the way this is all positive isn't it it is I don't know if you remember I showed you a video when we were studying Revelation on the mark of the beast but a lot of people in Europe already are getting uh, chip parties 
all their medical ID stuff is on that. So if ha something happens, they scan it. Everything is there. You're ready to go. They don't need keys for their homes because it's their IRF RFD chip is right in there. Cars. I mean, isn't that going to be the cell? The cell is going to be, this is going to make your life so much better, so much easier. Um, where was I, who was I think, uh, talking about with this? Oh, uh, I was talking to my friend in Florida about this because he's a big AI guy. And he goes, Dan, Elon Musk, all these guys are, are already going time out, but it's too late. Everything's out. Whoever gets to the top of the hill the quickest wins this battle. It just, it's the way it is. So either good people are going to do it or bad people are going to do it. And I'm not sure if there's going to be any good people at the top of the thing. But he said, the, the language out there in the evolutionary business world is AI is going to be the best thing that humanity has ever seen until it isn't. Isn't that a great statement? It's going to be the best thing that humanity has ever seen until it isn't. And that's going to be the scary part of things. So, But hey, I'm a, believers, I'm a believer in Jesus. I'm going to be out of here by then. And all God's people said, please, amen. Yeah. So until then, uh, chew a lot of gum with uh, aluminum wrapper and uh, start uh, putting your tin hat on. So uh, we'll be doing that. Uh, sure. Yes. Yeah. T the Tower of Babel is is man's attempt to be God. In fact, the Hebrew on that pat when we get to Genesis eleven is that they actually built that to go to fight God, like we're equal with Him. You know, that's where that intelligent design thing was like. Hmm. God will stop this too. Yeah. 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 And if you think about um, in Revelation 13, uh, not only the mark of the beast, but if you remember the false prophet uh, builds a statue and it comes to life and speaks and you've got all of that stuff coming our way. So, and I, don't, I, I saw this too. It was a, a special a thing that came over my... my um, Theo feeds, you know, uh, there are a lot of people that are already thinking that this is already a bad thing. For example, all of the folks out in Hollywood, they're going, hey, wait a minute, that last film had all digitally created actors and actresses. There wasn't a single person that was a live person in that film and it's like wait a minute I think we just uh, I think we just uh, we're, we're, I think we just worked ourselves out of a job here by supporting things that are actually actually going to say yeah we don't need you anymore by the way so and when it talked about the economic uh, issue on that they're already predicting probably within some are saying five years I think it's going to be less than that almost a half a million jobs will be gone in a heartbeat because they're just going to say we don't need you we already see that with automation don't we in factories so if you've got a technical skill set at some point you're going to be uh, obsolete they won't need you anymore so but Inter manipulated or intermixed yeah, I was telling somebody too in Daniel chapter 2 when it talks about the 10 toes, the 10 kingdoms intermixed with iron and clay. But they don't hold. Uh, so there's a lot of things that I think scholars are looking back at and going, wow, we never thought about that 10 years ago. And boy, is that stuff coming quickly. So as we enter into how God formed man, we need to be thinking too, for what purpose did he create him that way? It's going to be important as we study this. Good. Awesome. Let me pray for you.
Father, thank you for your goodness to us and uh, for just your kindness in the way that you made us relationally with you. And Lord, as we think about all the artificial intelligence, uh, all the things coming our way, it's a, it's a bit scary, Lord. And uh, yet we are not called to fear. Uh, we are called uh, to be fearless, to be courageous, and uh, to be that which you called us out to be. Um, at the end of the day, uh, artificial intelligence is still artificial. Somebody has to put the data in. And uh, so, Father, right now, uh, humanity is still needed, uh, but we can see a time where it's not. And so, God, we pray your blessings on us as we see these things, these things rushing toward us, Lord, that we might be about the work of reaching people for Christ before the great call of God and the trumpet blasts and we are taken home. So grace us with your presence as we continue to think about these things, Lord, and uh, let us continue to be mindful of that which is out there in our world and uh, open our scriptures and uh, see what God has to say about it. So thank you for your kindness, Lord, in that way, for giving us the truth and for allowing us to study it so that we are not caught off guard but prepared. And for that, we thank you as well. Bless, Lord, as we go home. Give us safety. Give us rest. Give us an amazing weekend ahead of us, Lord, we pray. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, please. Amen. Thank you, church.